so excited to see what God's going to do in his house this evening. Let's just lift our voices to his name in praise. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me and I'm going middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive I raise a hallelujah with that I raise a hallelujah I will watch the darkness flee I raise a hallelujah In the middle of the mystery I raise a hallelujah Fear you've lost your hold on me And I'm gonna see In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise And death is defeated The king is alive In the 
middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes What will arise Death is defeated The King is alive And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is So verse 2, it says, you take the broken things and raise them to glory. Um, raise your hand if you know we live in America. Um, last time I broke something, where'd it go? In the garbage can. Um, but this is written from a biblical perspective at a time, and, and even in other countries, in other worlds, they wouldn't even imagine throwing away something because it was broken, it was repaired. Um, I've seen pictures of in Japan when a pot is broken, what do they repair it with? Gold. Its value increases because of its brokenness. We take a diamond from the rough and we break it and it gains value. And so sometimes when we say, Lord, I'm broken, it's throw me in your trash can, Lord, because that's all I am. We see this in scripture, Lord, I'm nothing more than dirty rags. So we're not the first to experience this feeling. And then we get to verse 3 and it says, I can finally see it. See what? I never deserved it. We never deserved it. Not once. Never will. Never have. It is all Him. And so I stop striving to be a son. I stop striving to be worthy of what Christ did on the cross. In my devotions the other day, the Lord was very clear. He said, stop trying to get on my cross. 
I died for you. You don't die for your sins. I did. I asked you to lay down your life for me. I didn't ask you to lay down your life for your sins. I did that. He did that. That's what we are saying when we're singing this. Oh, Lord, show us that sonship. Show us that. Lord, verse 3 again. Now I can finally see it. Sing it out. You're teaching me how to receive it. So let all the striving cease. This is my victory. Now I can finally see it. You're teaching me how to believe it. So let all the striving cease. This is my victory. And you are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I can see it. In the heavenly place undefeated With the one who has conquered it all Yes, Lord. Help us to walk that out, Lord. That sonship. That moment when you looked at the disciples and said, All the things I have done, you will do all of these and even greater. Those moments we look and say, I'm not Jesus. I never said I am. He said you'll do greater. He said I'll do greater. Yes, Lord. When I open up my mouth. When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. The authority that Jesus has given me. And when I open up my mouth, miracles start breaking out. I have the authority that Jesus has given me. When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority that Jesus has given me. And when I open up my mouth, miracles are breaking out. I have the authority. That Jesus has given me When I lift my voice and shout Every wall comes crashing down I have the authority That Jesus has given me And when I open up my mouth miracles they start breaking out Lord because you have spoken over me that you are my son you will do these things Lord when I lift my voice when I lift my voice and shout miracles start crashing out I have the authority Jesus has given me And when I open up my mouth Miracles start breaking out I have the authority That Jesus has given me One more time And when I lift my 
my voice and shout every wall comes crashing down I have the authority that Jesus has given me when I open up my mouth miracles start breaking out I have the authority that Jesus has given me and you are my champion and giants fall when you stand undefeated every battle you won I am who you say I am you crown me with confidence I see it in the heavens place undefeated by the power of your name I see it in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all hallelujah father we just thank you that you have defeated it all Everything that would come against us is already defeated in the name of Jesus tonight. Everything that would rise up against the name of Christ is defeated right now. Father, I'm praying tonight, God, for miracles to take place. I'm praying tonight, God, for changed lives. I'm praying tonight, Lord God, for people to be set free from bondages. God, I'm praying tonight, Lord God, that you will release the captive. Father, you are able to do all things because of what Jesus did on that cross. Everything, everything is defeated in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. If you're here tonight and you came in with something that's, that's got you bound up, something that's holding you back, something that's hindering in your life, I want you to get ready to let go of it tonight, to release it in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes we hold on to those things. They become like a, a, a comfort to us, a comforting blanket, if you will. And we hold on to them. But Jesus wants you to let go of it tonight. He has conquered it. He has defeated it. And you can let go of it. And when you let go of it, you're going to find the freedom that you've been wanting and longing for. But you didn't even know it because you've been holding on to it. So tonight, as we get ready to go, let's just... Let's just take a moment and just, just thank the Lord right now for, for the victory that is in His name. Let's thank Him. Just raise up your voices and thank Him tonight. God, we just praise You tonight that You have the victory. God, over those things that we've been holding on to, over the things in our lives that have had us bound, and, and God, we've held on to them for so long, but tonight, God, we declare that we want to let go. We want to release them into Your hands. And God, we want the victory that You purchased for us in our lives, Lord. We want to receive that tonight tonight. We want to have victory tonight. Lord, we don't want to walk around defeated and downcast and downtrodden. Lord, we want the victory in our lives tonight. Oh, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that there is victory in Jesus tonight. Amen? Can you say amen to that tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. Give him a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Hallelujah. It's so good to have each one of you back here tonight. Good crowd here on a Tuesday night. Man, this is awesome. Uh, we have been having some powerful services and are just excited to have you with us tonight as God begins to move once again and do some great things. I hope that you came ready. Are you ready? Oh, come on. Are you ready? All right. I hope that you are ready to receive what God has for you tonight. Uh, I'm going to introduce my friend once again. Brother Tim Todd is going to come now. He is going to share uh, with us the Word of God and, and just all that's on his heart. Let's just give him a hand clap of praise as he comes now to share with us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Love you, my friend. Appreciate you. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand of praise one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you are, came tonight expecting for the power of God to flow in your life freely? Amen. 
I tell you, the Lord has really been doing a mighty, mighty work in our life this week at Grace Point Assembly of God, and I believe that tonight the Holy Spirit is going to take us to a new level and a new dimension in Him. So I want you to prepare yourself to receive from God. I want to ask, how many of you have got unsaved family members that live in this area? Raise your hand. If any of you have got family members, I want you to do everything that you can to get them in the house of God tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, and if they don't live in this area, we're going to pray for your unsaved family members as well, in Jesus' name. But I'm going to be sharing my personal testimony tomorrow night, titled, Case Dismissed. How many of you know that God in heaven is ready to dismiss the case of every family member that is not serving the Lord? Do everything that you can to get family members that are not saved in the house of God tomorrow night. I'm going to believe God with you for them to get their hearts in right relationship with the Lord and for God to dismiss their case. Amen? And then also, don't sleep while I'm preaching. I've got this gavel up here. I'm just kidding. No, but seriously, God's going to do a mighty work in that service tomorrow night. So come tomorrow night expecting for the power of God to flow. Amen? In just a moment, we're going to receive a special offering uh, for the ministry of Revival Fires. And your offering tonight is going to go to help us provide the Spanish Truth for Youth Bible for illegal immigrants coming into America from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Mexico. We've had more than 23,000 children ages 12 to 18 years old that have actually been coming in by themselves because they know that if they come in by themselves, the parents know, and uh, the, uh, uh, those that are bringing them in, then they get to stay in America. So I was praying about this right after the election. And I said, God, what can we do as a ministry to get the Spanish Truth for Youth Bible into the hands of these children, these young people, grades uh, uh, that are, are high school, junior high uh, age children that are underage? How in the world could we do that? And the Holy Spirit put everything together and listen to what just happened. About a week and a half ago, I got a telephone call from a pastor of a very small church in South Texas that is very best friends with one of the directors of one of the facilities that houses 2,000 young men coming in from the Central America and uh, 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 they keep it full and they've got those young men for two weeks. During that two weeks, they are then either dispersed into foster care or a sponsor or a family member here in America, but they get to stay here in America, and, but they've got them for two weeks. I'm going to get to go on one of those facilities this Monday, this Monday, and I'm going to get to preach to those 2,000 young men. The director who is spirit-filled said, Brother Tim, they are, the, the majority of them don't know anything about God. And he, we're going to have an evangelistic service this coming Monday, and I'm going to get to give every one of those 2,000 young men that have come into America illegally a copy of the Spanish Truth for Youth Bible. Can somebody say a big amen? That is a huge, huge deal. And he asked us if we could provide Bibles for the young men as they come in and out of there on a regular basis. That means that every two weeks through the ministry of Revival Fires, we are going to provide 2,000 Bibles every two weeks. As long as God provides the money for this, we're going to provide Bibles because how many of you know that whenever these illegal immigrants, when they stand before God, God's not going to ask them to see a green card. God's not going to ask them if they have U.S. citizenship. The only citizenship that God's going to be concerned about is whether or not they're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Whether or not they've got their, lamb, their name written in the Lamb's book of life. How many of you know that they need God? 
They need Jesus. And, and I'm telling you, with the political landscape that we live in right now, this is just a, a, a spectacular opportunity. So, what I'm going to do is this. I have already, of the, uh, for this trip, this coming uh, uh, Monday, and I'll fly out actually uh, uh, in just, you know, I'll get home and I'll be home for a couple of days, then I'll fly right there to South Texas, Harlington, Texas, and I'll be over there for, for several days praying over that facility, making the first distribution and providing those Bibles on a regular basis. So tonight, what you give in the offering tonight, these Bibles cost our ministry $2 to print. What you give in the offering tonight is going to help us provide this coming Monday 2,000 Bibles at $2 each, $4,000 worth of Bibles, $4,000 worth of Bibles for 2,000 young men that are coming into our nation illegally. So I want you to ask God how many Bibles he would have you to provide because I'm telling you, God's going to bless you big time for helping us to provide the Truth For Youth Bible in Spanish for these young men that are coming into our nation illegally. And you know, it's not a good thing for our nation for all of these people coming in illegally. They need to wait in, in line. But guess what? They're coming. There's not anything I can do to keep them from coming. So you know what they need? They need Jesus. They need a copy of the Word of God. So you pray about this tonight, and you ask God how many Bibles he would have you to provide. And thank you in advance for helping us provide Bibles for, and I never thought I would be able to say this, and even though I was praying about it, it's kind of one of those deals where that, uh, 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 you know, where that uh, you're praying about something, and then God does it, and you're shocked because when I got this phone call, I was on a three-way call with the director of this facility and this pastor and myself, and I got off the phone, and, and, and Angie was right there for the phone call, and, and I, said, I said, this is a shocker. And she said, Tim, you've been praying exactly for this. <laughs> And so, so we're so thankful that God answers prayers and God cares about these people. You know what? God cares about these people that are coming into our nation illegally more than anybody cares about them. And we're going we're gonna to introduce them to Jesus Christ. We're going to introduce them to the Word of God. And so thank you in advance for helping us provide these Bibles in Jesus' name. Ushers, if you will, join me here in the front. And uh, uh, brother, if you will, just softly begin playing. I'm going to pray and ask God to show you what to do tonight in this offering. If you make out a check, make it out to the church body. If you're giving a uh, uh, text to give, it's 84321. Or you can go to the website, gphickson.com, or the church app and put guest speaker in there. We'll keep track of what comes in for the offering tonight. For Bibles, for people coming into America illegally. Just, I'm so thankful for this opportunity to provide these Bibles. How about you? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for honoring your word, and I thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to be able to preach on the grounds of one of these facilities, the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ, and giving an opportunity for these young men to give their life to you. Lord, I call in a harvest of these young men getting saved. And Lord, as these that are here tonight at Grace Point Assembly of God prepare to give and be a part of bringing this harvest in, I pray that you will speak specific amounts to each person and show them what you would have them to do in this special offering tonight. And I ask you, Father God, in Jesus' name, to honor your word as I know you're going to do. And as they give sacrificially, to provide Bibles for these immigrants coming into America, I ask you to open the windows of heaven over each one that is obedient to do what you tell them to do and pour out more blessings on them for giving tonight than they have room enough even to receive. I speak it done, Lord God, and thank you in advance, Lord, for a miracle offering tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen and amen. God bless you tonight as you give. Oh, sorry. I was checking your pastor's reflexes whenever I went back there with that gavel. And he almost kicked me, so they're working well. 
Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. Didn't the worship team do a wonderful job tonight? Thank you, Brother Josh. Appreciate you very, very much. Mark chapter 2, stand with me tonight in reverence to God for the reading of our text. I've got CD, DVD combos on my table in the foyer area. Powerfully anointed messages that will help you to live for God. I encourage you to get those and get them into the hands of your friends and family members. I know that they will be a huge blessing to you in Jesus' name. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Several days later, and I'm reading from the God's Word translation. Several days later, Jesus came back to Capernaum. The report went out that he was home. Many people had gathered. There was no room left even in front of the door. Jesus was speaking God's word to them. Four men came to him carrying a paralyzed man. Since they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof over the place where Jesus was. Then they lowered the cot on which the paralyzed man was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Some scribes were sitting there and they thought, they thought, why does he talk this way? He's dishonoring or blaspheming God. Who besides God can forgive sins? At once Jesus knew inwardly what they were thinking. He asked them, why do you have these thoughts? Is it easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your cot, and walk? I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralyzed man, I'm telling you, to get up, pick up your cot, and go home. The man got up immediately, picked up his cot, and walked away while everyone watched. Everyone was amazed and praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. The title of my message tonight, Exceeded Expectation. Remain standing and bow with me for a word of prayer. Father, I ask you tonight to exceed our expectation. I don't know, Lord, exactly what everybody came for tonight, but I pray that you will do above and beyond anything that they could ever hope or ask for and accomplish in their lives, in their families, in their homes, in every area, all that you want to accomplish. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen and amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. <clears throat> you know, 50 years ago, if you were looking for me in a church building, you would not have found me on a Sunday morning behind the pulpit because I would have been about nine years old. But instead, you would have most likely found me in a Sunday school room standing on a chair, singing a song at the top of my lungs that we sang every Sunday morning. Most of you will remember it, the B-I-B-L-E. Right. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand upon the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And then we'd all shout as loud as we could, Bible. All right, 12 of you went to Sunday school. How about the rest of you? <laughs> But what began as a simple, cute kid song in children's church and Sunday school has now transformed, transcended into a core belief in my life because, hear me, Pastor, I truly do stand upon the Word of God. Hear me tonight. I'm a Bible preacher. I love the Word of God. I'm literally, I am obsessed with the Word of God. Now, if you're here tonight and you think that this is just some kind of a boring, antiquated book that does not apply to your life and doesn't relate to you, I want you to know if you think that, then you have lost your mind because this is the only book that is still alive. This is the only book that is still yes. breathing. Yes. This is the only book that still has power. This is the only book that was written in antiquity, but it can still hit the specificity of every area of your life. Amen. I love the Word of God. Amen. Now, I love all of the Bible, but I have a special place in my heart for the literary genre of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they tell you all about the, the uh, personal life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Amen? How he walked, how he talked, how he interacted with, with the people around him, how he revolutionized the entire world in just three years with 12 crazy dudes. I mean, I love the four Gospels. And, and there's a lot of people that don't appreciate the Gospels, and one of the reasons they don't, 
don't is because they don't understand why the Gospels were written. You see, in the first few decades after the life of Christ, the, the Gospel was not written down. Did you know that? It was spread orally. And the reason that it was not uh, uh, written down is because there were so many eyewitnesses who had been there with Jesus, and they had been there, and they had seen him for themselves. And so it became very, very difficult for people to distort the personhood and character of who Jesus was in that day. For example, if somebody would have risen up in that day and said, you know, Jesus really didn't do miracles and signs and wonders. Jesus didn't take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000 people and, and their families. Oh, no, what he really did is he got on his cell phone and he called Red Lobster and he said, hey, I'm in trouble over here and I need some more fish and I need some more bread. You know, if something like that would have happened, there would have been a group there would have been a conglomerate of people, of believers that would have risen up and they would have said, wait a second, that is not true. I, I was there and I tasted the fish and I tasted the bread with my own lips. And, and, and in fact, I saw with my own eyes the miracle signs and wonders. But after a while, those, those eyewitnesses began to die off. And as those eyewitnesses began to die off, then the personhood of who Jesus was began to become distorted in that culture and in that society. But I found it very intriguing. Here's my point. I found it very intriguing that as long as there were eyewitnesses, as long as there were people who had been in the presence of Jesus Christ themselves, it was extremely hard to distort his personhood. May I submit to your consideration tonight that the reason why the personhood of Jesus Christ has become so distorted in our culture and in our society is because there are so few eyewitnesses. There are so few people who have been in the presence of Jesus Christ enough to, and, and, and it begins to distort the personhood of who he is. Listen, you can go to church all your life and still not know who Jesus is. Can I hear an amen? You listen, you can speak with more tongues than everybody in the United Nations put together and still not know who Jesus is. That's right. You can do more religious gymnastics and charismatic calisthenics than somebody on a workout video and still not know who Jesus is. Because hear me tonight, when Jesus is not intimately known, he cannot be accurately shown, and then the personhood and character of who he is will become distorted in that culture. Listen, I found out there's a lot of people that they, they, they don't want to reject Jesus. They want Jesus, but they just want Jesus on their terms. They want him to become their butler or their maid or their aide, the acquiescence of what their desires are. The great theologian A.W. Tozer said, and I quote, it's a strange paradox that God created man in his own image and now every day we try to recreate God in our own image. And the problem with trying to recreate God in our own image is that then we're left with a God who can never transcend you. He can never break through the narrow confines of your mind. He can never contradict you. And hear me tonight. If God can never contradict you, then you can never be changed because it's contradiction that is the catalyst for change. And I need God to contradict me. Amen? I, I, I need God to tell me to go to the right when I feel like going to the left. I need God to tell me to operate in faith when fear has gripped my heart. I need God to operate, tell me to operate in the Spirit when my flesh is going crazy. I need God to to help me to pray for my enemies and to love my enemies when I feel like speaking to them with another tongue that needs no interpretation. I need God to contradict me. And because when God contradicts me, that I begin to become conformed into the image of a son, Jesus Christ. Is there anybody at Grace Point Assembly of God tonight that wants to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ that would say like the Apostle Paul, oh, that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. I feel like preaching tonight. That's why I'm thankful tonight for the gospel writer, Mark, and for the four gospels because they come together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John come together in a concerted effort to give us a clear picture of what the real Jesus looks like. Here's what I like about the four gospel writers. They're all four talking about the same Jesus, but they do it in four completely different ways. It's as though they are four film directors. And each one of them had been given a cinematic license to give us an HD view of what Jesus looks like. And, and that's why I'm thankful tonight that Mark is our film director and our gospel writer in this story. So uh, for those of you sitting here that you like documentaries, 
You need to read the book of Matthew again because Matthew was written primarily to a Jewish audience. So he goes into the uh, long, laborious process of explaining that uh, Jesus was described in 300 Old Testament prophecies during a 1,500-year time frame. Now, for those of you sitting here, you like sci-fi films and you like to watch movies that are sci-fi films, you need to read the book of uh, Luke again because Luke was a medical doctor. And so Luke begins to tell us about the magnanimity of the miracles of Jesus and how that Jesus was able to perform miracles, signs, and wonders, healing, deliverance, raise the dead, when modern medicine of that day could not do it. Now, for those of you sitting here that you like the ushy, gushy, mushy love stories and the romance films, you need to read the book of John because John was the disciple that always had his head on the chest of Jesus. He was all about love. He was very existential. He said in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. That was John. But for those of you sitting here that like action films, that's me, yep. then come with me tonight to the book of Mark because Mark, Mark described Jesus in action. Mark wanted you to know that before there was a Russell Crowe in Gladiator, before there was a Mel Gibson in Braveheart, before there was an Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator, there was King Jesus, and when King Jesus came on the scene, every devil in hell had to bow its knee to his authority. Hallelujah. So here's Jesus in this story, and he's walking. He's picking up his walking miles. He's traveling, and, and he stopped at the house. And Bible scholars and theologians believe that that house, Pastor Terry, belonged to Peter. And so Jesus comes into that house, and when he gets in that house, he was tired, no doubt, from, from traveling. The Bible says that he sat down and he rested in that house. And within minutes of Jesus coming into that house and just sitting down to rest in that house, right after he got there, he comes in and he sits down to rest in that house. People from the entire area started getting the word out that Jesus was in that house. I mean, no doubt they were getting on Facebook and, and, and uh, 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 emailing and texting and, and they were on Twitter and uh, they were, I mean, they were saying, hey, Jesus is in the house. Get over here as fast as you can. And within minutes of Jesus coming in to simply sit down and rest in that house, people from every different background, every different culture came simply because his presence came to rest in the house. All right. Now, what is it that will cause people from all over the area to come to Grace Point, Assembly of God? Because people instinctively know if, could, if you can ever get His presence to come rest in the house, Amen. something life-changing, supernatural will take place if you can ever get His presence to come rest in the house. That's right. yes. Why are you here tonight on a Tuesday night? Hello? You could be at home watching reruns of Duck Dynasty tonight. Why are you here? I don't believe you're here because of the preaching. I don't believe you're here because of the music. I believe every one of you are here tonight because you knew his presence was going to be resting in this house. And, and there's something about the presence of Jesus Christ resting in the house at Grace Point like God has been doing this week that heightens the level of expectancy for people to come. Amen. So here's Jesus in this story mm -hmm. in the book of Mark, chapter 2. And I can use my exegetical imagination. I can see that house jam-packed with people. You know there, that it had to be. Mm -hmm. I, can see, uh, I can see sick people in that house thinking to themselves, if I can just get close enough to him to touch him, I believe I'll be made whole. And I can use my practical imagination too. I can see a woman sitting on the front row with her son who's not paying attention. He's on his iPhone 12 and he's playing games. And she looks at him and she says, young man, you pay attention. Jesus is in the house and he's going to tell you something that's going to change your life. And we know that Jesus was single and in the ministry, right? I mean, was he not? So you know there had to be single young ladies in that crowd of people. They were looking at Jesus and saying, Woo! Yahshua is fine. Look at that hair. I heard the other day he turned water into wine. If he asked me out on a date, I'm ordering water. 
So here's these people in this house and Jesus is preaching. They're watching to see what he's going to do when in actuality they should have been listening to hear what he was going to say. Jesus stood up. He probably cleared his holy throat. And the Bible says he began to preach the word to them. Now that makes me want to shout. Listen, my dad, Cecil Todd, is uh, 89 years old and he is, uh, uh, has been in the ministry now, Pastor Terry, for 72 years and he's an evangelist and, he, and he's still preaching, at 89 years old, still preaching the gospel and he preaches the unadulterated word of God. Listen to me. I've only been on the evangelistic field now for a little over 34 years, but I have strived to preach the word. I want everybody in here that is called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to listen to me very, very careful. Whenever you get in the pulpit, whatever you do, preach the word. I charge you tonight, preach the word of God. Pastor Terry, not everybody who gets in the pulpit is preaching the word of God. We've got people that get in the pulpit today that are called into the ministry and instead of preaching the word, they'll, they'll preach pop psychology or they'll, they'll tell stories or, or they'll, uh, uh, you know, just do the, this, that, and the other that doesn't line up with the word of God. And then they don't understand why they don't see transformation in people's lives. Hear me tonight. The only thing that will transform a sin-sick soul is when the gospel of Jesus Christ goes forth under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hebrews chapter 4, here's what the Word of God says about itself. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the, of, of the heart. I love to hear the Word of God preached. Can I hear an Amen. amen. I don't even care what kind of a homiletical style you've got, Pastor. As long as you're preaching the Word of God, I'm right there with you. I don't mind hearing soft-spoken preachers as long as they're preaching from the Word of God. I love to hear fiery preachers with an organ playing behind them. How about you? (laughs) This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. And now you know why I don't sing while I'm preaching. Hallelujah. (laughs) So here is Jesus in this story the most extraordinary preacher ever to walk the face of the earth. Preaching. Do you know why I preach tonight like I've had six Red Bulls to drink? Because I've had six Red... No, I haven't. I promise. I promise. Do you know why I preach with so much passion, so much excitement, so much fire? Because I know that whenever I get to heaven, nobody's going to want to hear me preach. So I'm going to get all my preaching done here. When we get to heaven, we're going to want to hear Jesus preach. So watch this. In this story, now watch this. Here is Jesus in this story, the living word preaching the written word. You see, when Pastor Terry gets in the pulpit, whenever I get in the pulpit, we just have a word. Jesus was the word made flesh. That means that if Jesus wanted to preach an illustrated message about the word of God, All he had to do was go like this. (laughs) Because he was the Word. He had more revelation in his big toe than anybody who had matriculated from the upper echelon of the most prestigious theological seminary. He was profound and proficient in excavating and extrapolating the complexities that are found hidden within the crevices of any biblical composition. Right? Do you agree? I mean, he was the Word made flesh. Yes. So here he is, Jesus is preaching. And all of a sudden, there's an interruption to his message. He looks up and, 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 and there's a hole that's appearing in, in the roof. Now you remember that most Bible scholars believe that this house that he's preaching in belongs to Peter. <laughs> If there is a disciple in the Bible that you do not want to tear a hole in their roof, it's Peter. If you're going to tear a hole in in a disciple's roof, start with somebody like John. John would have looked back up. John would have looked up and seen the hole being torn in his roof, and John would have said, "Oh, now I can see the stars that my heavenly Father hath made for me to see." But not Peter. Oh no, Peter would hurt you. 
<laughs> Peter would cuss you. Peter would cuss you. Because Peter, Peter was crazy. So I can see Jesus preaching in this, in this house. And, and Peter, boy, he's proud. He's standing right next to Jesus. And, and, and Peter looks up and he sees a hole begin to appear in his roof. And Peter says, what in that? And Jesus says, watch your mouth, Peter. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> we talked about this, Peter. This man began to become lowered down into the presence of Jesus where he belonged. Did you know the Bible does not tell us what this man's name was? Did you know that the Word of God does not even have the courtesy of telling us how long he's been a paralytic? The Bible simply says that he is a man with a paralysis. Why is that noteworthy? Because as you study Scripture, you'll find that one of the literary nuances in the Word of God is that when Jesus interacts with people in the Bible, rarely do we get their name. But more often than not, we get their gender and their condition. Have you noticed that? There's a man with a withered hand. There's a woman with an issue of blood. There's a man who was blind. There's a man who is deaf. We get their gender and we get their condition. What does this speak to? It speaks to the human tendency and propensity to identify people, follow me here, to identify people by the dysfunction in their life. Oh, we love to do that in America, don't we? We love to identify people by the thing that they're going through, by the dysfunction in their life, by the thing that they haven't completely got the victory over yet. We love to do that. We're the only, we're the only society that I know of in America that will call somebody something for 40 years that they did in four minutes. We like to say things like this. We like to say, you see him, he still smokes cigarettes. You see her, she's still an alcoholic. You see him, he committed adultery on his wife. We love to identify people by the dysfunction in their life or by the thing that they're going through until it comes to the point that they begin to think that they are the dysfunction that, they, that they're going through or the thing that they're struggling with. But I've got some good news for you tonight. Look right here. No matter what has happened to you in the past, if you give your life to Jesus Christ and you're serving him, the Bible says for you and me, old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. It doesn't matter what people say about you. Doesn't matter what people think about you. Doesn't matter what people gossip about you. You can look those people in the face and say, you know what? You may know a lot about my history but you don't know anything about my destiny because there are greater things that are in front of me that are behind me for greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So they began to identify this man by the dysfunction in his life. And then watch this. He was in the presence of Jesus Christ, right? But he still had a paralysis. Let me say that again. He was in the presence of Jesus Christ, but he still had a paralysis. Listen, listen closely. Tonight, you are here in the presence of Jesus Christ, but many of you sitting here have got a paralysis. Something that is impeding your mobility, that is keeping you from being everything that you want to be for God. Some of you sitting here cry out to God in your private secret place and you say, God, if I just didn't have this going on in my family, if I just didn't have, if I didn't have this going on in my, in my life, I could move to the next level in you. But the truth is, we love to pretend like we're okay when we're really not. Yeah. Is that not true? Oh, I'm sure none of y'all sitting here have got anything going on. You probably all got up this morning and drank Kool-Aid out of your water fountain when you got out of bed and you had manna for breakfast, but can, can we just be real? We like to act like it's okay when it's not really okay. We like to pretend like we don't have any paralysis or any problems when we really do. I've often thought that if, if Hollywood needed more actors and actresses, they wouldn't have to go to the Juilliard or to the Academy Awards or the Golden Globe. They could just come right here to our church buildings and they'd find all the actresses and actresses that they needed to find. 
Because we like to act like we're all right when we're really not all right. We like to act like we don't need any help when we really do need help. Is that true? And, you know, people will come to the house of God. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. God bless you. Oh, he does. And just right before that, you're on your way to church yelling at each other, ready to pull each other's hair out. But as soon as you get to church, you're like, hallelujah. Everything's good. God has a way of bringing us to the right place at the right time to hear the right word so we can do the right work in every area of our life. And in this story, thank God for these four friends. You know what kind of friends they were? They had an attitude towards this man that was paralyzed. They said this, you know, we don't know what to do for you, but we sure know who does know what to do for you. We can get you into the presence of somebody who can do what needs to be done for you. And... You need to be careful, young person, about who you surround yourself with. Amen. You, don't need, you don't need to surround yourself with people spiritually that are going to keep you down on the ground. Yeah. You need friends that spiritually, you need tear off the roof friends that are going to do whatever it takes to help yeah. you stay in the presence amen. of God. Right. Amen, amen, right. and amen. amen. And so here's Jesus preaching, and all of a sudden he has an interruption what an interruption, Pastor Terry. He's preaching, and somebody begins to tear a hole in the roof. If that happens to you, you may as well shut that sermon down. And don't you know that the people in that house had to be taken back? And, and, but don't, don't you know there were some that got excited? Because you know it had to already be rumored throughout the land that this man Jesus that's preaching to them performed miracle signs and wonders, healing, brought deliverance, victory in people's lives. So whenever that paralyzed man began to be lowered down through that roof, there had to be a handful of people in that building, in that church, in that house, that looked up and said, oh, it's about to go down. I don't know if, they're gonna put, I don't know if he's going to put mud on his legs or what he's going to do, but this is going to be awesome. You better, get your, uh, you better get your smartphone out. Get ready to put this up on Facebook and YouTube. Hallelujah. This is going to be incredible. And don't you know that man, that paralyzed man, he had to be embarrassed. I mean, he's paralyzed and he's being lowered down in front of all of these people. But all of a sudden, his embarrassment is eradicated with elation because he realizes for the very first time he's going to be able to get up. He's going to be able to walk. He's going to be able to run. He's going to be able to try out for dancing with the stars. Hallelujah. <laughs> so while this man is ready to dance and the crowd is ready to shout, the son of man that has the power to heal him, right? Yeah. Looks at this man, this paralyzed man, and Jesus says to him, Friend, your sins are forgiven. What? Now, those of you that are super spiritual, you're thinking to yourself, oh, yes, Brother Todd, he's dealing with the real problem uh, of the sin. That's true. But, you know, I like to put myself in the middle of a story whenever I read a story in the Bible. That's why I probably would have been kicked out of the Bible if I would have been in there in Genesis chapter 1 because I have a tendency to be a, a little bit sardonic, a little bit sarcastic, but I can see this story unfolding like this. I mean, here's this paralyzed man he has to round up four friends to carry him, and he's got it in his mind. He's just going to go in that house, and Jesus is going to heal him. He gets to the house, and the place is jam-packed, so he can't go in the door. So then they have to go around the side and shimmy him up the side of a house, climb up on top of that roof, and then tear a hole in the roof, and then embarrassingly, he's dropped down in front of all of these people, right in front of Jesus. You know he's there to be healed, Right? And then Jesus looks at him and he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. This man's got to be thinking to himself, oh yeah, Jesus, that's what I came for is have my sins forgiven. I didn't want to, want to get up, didn't want to walk, didn't want to run. I didn't want to learn how to dance. I just came to have my sins forgiven. Mission accomplished, now let's all go home. Mm. Mm. That man did not say anything to Jesus about wanting his sins forgiven or having a struggle. It looks as though in this story, Jesus is the only person in this house that doesn't realize that man did not come to that service to have his sins forgiven. He came because he wanted to learn to do the moonwalk. 
But any time in Scripture Jesus appears to be acting ignorant, pay close attention. He's getting ready to give you an incredible insight. Let me say that more eloquently. There is a profundity to the alleged stupidity of Christ. This man doesn't realize it, but he is right where he needs to be for God to reveal himself to him. You see, there are many of you sitting here tonight that you're going through things in your life. Let me tell you something. Many times, <clears throat> God will allow you to get in situations that you're in so that he can get your attention. Let me say it this way. When your experience is not lining up with your expectation, it's a setup for God to give you a revelation of who he is. Amen. I'm going to say that again. Right. When your experience is not lining up with your expectation, it's a setup for God to give you a revelation of who he is. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, I found out that most of the time, Jesus in the Bible is not recognized, he's revealed. And he reveals himself to you when your experience is not lining up with what you thought was going to happen. How many of you can raise your hand with me and say, that's happened to me a bunch. It sure happened to me a bunch. I'm going to give you an example in the Word of God. You remember Mary and Martha and Lazarus was sick and he's like, oh, I feel like I've got the black plague and I'm going to die. And Mary stressed out. She said, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. My only brother, he's sick and it looks like he's going to die. And Martha's got more faith. So Martha's like, Mary, why are you stressed out? When Jesus comes to this area to preach, where does he stay? And Mary's like, he stays right here at our house. And Martha says, that's exactly right. He's got everything under control and everything's going to be all right. Martha says, where's my cell phone? I'm going to text Jesus right now. Mm -hmm. So he picks up his cell phone and, and, and Martha does and, and she starts texting Jesus. She says, Jesus, Lazarus, the one you love is sick. You're the healer. Do what you do. Sin. We know Jesus is probably across town preaching and he hears a cell phone go off in the service. And Jesus turns around, looks at his disciples and says, I told you guys to turn your cell phone on silent while I'm preaching. And Andrew steps forward and Andrew says, uh, Master, that's yours. And Jesus is like, oh, my bad. <laughs> and Jesus responds immediately. Martha, do not worry. This sickness will not end in death. Now, if you got a text like that, wouldn't you automatically think he was going to heal him? Right? So don't you know Mary and Martha, they are dancing and shouting. They're running the aisles and jumping the pews. They're singing, he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. They're running and jumping and shouting, and no more than Mary gives Martha a high five, Lazarus dies. Jesus did not come to the funeral. Jesus did not come to the graveside service. In fact, Jesus did not show up until four days after Lazarus was stinking and in the grave. So don't you know that by now, after four days, don't you know that Mary and Martha, they were not just grieving, they had to be somewhat angry. And then Jesus shows up while they're grieving and Jesus is like, hey, how's it going? And they're like, no, you didn't. Jesus, where were you? If you'd have been here, Jesus, have you ever tried to tell Jesus what he should have done? <laughs> Mary and Martha, they're like, Jesus, if you would have just been here, you could have healed him. What a testimony that would have been. The Bible says that Jesus went to the grave, called Lazarus by name, because if he would have not have called him by name, everybody would have come out of their graves in that cemetery. He called Lazarus by his name, Lazarus come forth, and Lazarus came forth. Now watch this. Listen, don't miss this. You see, Mary and Martha, their experience was not lining up with their expectation, and it was a setup for God to give them a revelation that not only did Jesus have supernatural power to heal the sick, but he also had resurrection power to raise Lazarus from the dead. That's right. Some of you sitting here tonight, What's been going on in your life has not been lining up with what you thought was going to happen. It's just a setup for God to give you a revelation of who he is. Amen. 
How many of you know sometimes it's not until your money's funny and your change is strange? They're downsizing on the job during COVID-19. It's then you realize more than ever that Jesus is Jehovah Jireh, the provider. Where, where the devil is attacking your finances and yet you're still eating three meals a day and putting food on the table and God is, real, and God is, God is showing you, God is revealing to you that he is your source and that your job is just your resource. Amen. How many of you know sometimes it's not until you get real, real sick in your body that then you realize, that's when you realize more than ever, Jesus is Jehovah Rapha, the great physician. Sometimes it's not until you confide in somebody and tell them in strictest confidence something that is not to be said to anybody else and then they reveal it to somebody else. It's then that you realize that Jesus is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. And I had this strange suspicion tonight that some of you sitting here that the very thing that you've been complaining about, you should be thanking God for because it is an opportunity, a setup for God to give you a revelation of who he is. So what is God revealing to this paralyzed man? Jesus said to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Only a, only a, uh, only a mighty, mighty, only a Savior could say that, could make that public declaration. And he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. And this man's got to be standing there, or uh, paralyzed. This man's got to be laying there thinking, hello, Jesus. Jesus, look here. My legs. I, I, they don't work. You don't even know what my, what my problem is, preacher. And Jesus is like, no, you don't know what your problem is. You think your problem is the paralysis in your, in your body. But that's just the fruit of the problem. That's just the fruit of the problem. The root of the problem is the sin. And I'm not going to deal with the fruit of the problem until after I deal with the root of the problem. You say, oh, we all want God to deal with the fruit of the problem, don't we? And God says, I'll deal with the fruit of the problem after I deal with the root of the problem. Now, I'm not postulating an erroneous doctrine that would tell you that all sickness is a result of sin because that's not scriptural. Let me tell you what Jesus is telling us in this story. You see, sin entered the earth through Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It was never God's desire for you to be sick or to have disease or to even, uh, uh, even to die. That was never God's desire. So God said, I'm going to deal with the circumstance, but first I'm going to deal with the sin. I'm going to deal with the ailment that you've got, but first I've got to deal with the alienation of your spirit because I'm not just the God of your circumstance, but I'm also the God of your soul, and I must deal with both. Amen. One of the doctrines that we need to understand tonight is that God is not just the God of our circumstance. He's also the God of our soul. I'm going to give you a really good example with the truth of the Bible. When the Holy Spirit laid in my heart to design this Bible for young people, the entire New Testament, along with comic stories in the front section dealing with the truth about things like drugs, drunkenness, peer pressure, pornography, sexual purity, abortion, homosexuality. We've got comics that deal with the truth about cutting, sexting, bullying, suicide, all of these different things that we deal with. The Holy Spirit had laid in my heart that we needed to get the Word of God back in school, but the Holy Spirit also led me to put the plan of salvation in each one of the stories. You know why? Because more important than getting the Word of God back in school, and we do need to have the Word of God back in school, more important than having the Word of God back in school is that we need to see these young people that get these Bibles find their way to the foot of the cross and get saved. And as a result of distributing more than 2.7 million of these Bibles, and I've got them out there on my table, uh, we have seen more than 25,000 young people give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ for the very first time. Somebody give a Lord, the Lord a hand clap of praise. He's not just a God of our circumstance that we need prayer and Bible reading back in our schools, but he's also the God of our soul, and he is very, very concerned about young people making it to heaven a whole lot more than he is about getting the Word of God back in school. Right. Both are important, but there's no comparison between the two. Amen. 
So here Jesus is preaching. The Bible says that also in the room were the religious people. Pretentiously puffed up with pomposity and pride. Have you noticed that religious people, most of them all have the same look on their face like this? Like they've, got, like, like they've uh, been baptized in pickle juice, got a face so long they look like they could suck soup out of a saxophone. The Bible says that the disciples, that, that these, these religious people in the room, that they, they thought to themselves. They thought to themselves. That's what religious people do. They may not say it, but boy, they sure think it. <laughs> the Bible says that they thought to themselves, huh, he's blaspheming, he's dishonoring, he's blaspheming. Who but God alone can forgive sin? No, they were blaspheming because they were calling Jesus a blasphemer, and that's blasphemy to call Jesus a blasphemer. That's right. Amen? The Bible says they thought to themselves, who but God alone can forgive sin? And Jesus... Have you noticed that religious people try to accuse you of doing things that they are guilty of themselves? Amen. Have you noticed that? A, a religious person will come up to you in church and they'll say, a religious person will come up to you and they'll say, they'll say, hey, you better watch out for that person over there because they gossip all the time. <laughs> and you're thinking to yourself, you're gossiping about them being a gossiper, so that makes you a gossiper. See law. The Bible says that the disciples, the, the religious people thought, who but God, thought to themselves, who but God alone can forgive sin? And he was so much God, Jesus, that he was, think, he was reading their thoughts. And, and Jesus said, why are you thinking these things? He said, is it easier for me to say, friend, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat, and walk? And Jesus said, so that you may know that the Son of Man has all authority. Can we just thank God tonight that Jesus has all authority? Heaven is His throne and the earth is His footstool and no matter what you're going through tonight, the King of kings and the Lord of lords has all authority and He has everything under control. Trust Him. Amen. Jesus said, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth and he looked at the man the paralyzed man and he said get up he didn't say here's a seven week CD series on how to get up <laughs> he didn't say let's gather around him and help him get up oh no Jesus looked at that paralyzed man and he said get up and God is speaking to somebody here tonight. God is saying, get up. I want to heal your body tonight. Get up. I want to heal your finances tonight. Get up. I want to heal your family tonight. I want to heal your marriage tonight. Get up. I've got a new work. I want to do through you at Grace Point Assembly of God. He said, get up. Right. This man, his legs start tingling. This paralyzed man, he stands up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know all about that, don't you, Dan? <laughs> Stacy coming out of her wheelchair on Sunday morning. Can I hear an amen and a hallelujah? And somebody to give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> hallelujah! That man gets up. His, his, and everybody in the whole building, in the house, when this paralyzed man gets up, everybody begins to shout and clap their hands. And then Jesus leaned over to that man that used to be paralyzed and he said to him, now, now take up your mat. And that man's got to be thinking, oh no, Jesus, I won't need my mat anymore. I can walk now, so I won't need my mat. And Jesus is like, oh no, take up your mat because I don't ever want you to forget that you were down, but now you're up. You know what that mat represents? That map represents your testimony and my testimony. Listen to me, I was lost, but I have a testimony. I have a mat, and I've been saved. Can I hear a hallelujah? Amen. Listen to me, listen right here. Listen, listen, I was smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. I was smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. I had a very, very, very expensive cocaine habit. I was an alcoholic, but guess what? I've got a mat, I've got a testimony, and I've been set free. Can I hear it? Is there anybody in here tonight that's been set free from anything? Amen. Hallelujah! You've got a mat. Don't ever forget where you came from. 
Because if you forget where you came from, you're going to forget where you're going. And if you forget where you're going, you're going to get lost somewhere in between. He said, get up. He said, take up your mat. And then he said, go home. Can you imagine this man walking home with that mat under his arm? He's walking by people and, and, and they're, they're thinking to themselves, now this is confusing. He used to be laying on that mat and used to be carried. Now he's carrying that mat. <laughs> he gets home. He does what Jesus told him. He went home. But I would imagine he probably got to the front door and he wanted to surprise his family. So instead of just walking in the house, he probably knocked on the front door. His kids come running to the front door and they open the door and they see their daddy standing up for the first time. They're like, Daddy, Daddy, you're standing. Daddy, you're walking. Mama, come here. She's in the kitchen. She's uh, uh, fixing fried chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy and green beans and, and corn and he's got gravy over all of it. Can I hear an amen? Is anybody hungry yet? So this, this woman, she comes out to the front door with an urgency and she stands there at the front door and she sees her husband standing up and she's so excited tears begin to stream down her cheeks and before she can say a word this man looks at her her husband and says sweetheart it's a miracle that I'm standing here now that my body's healed he said but I received even a bigger miracle my sins are forgiven too Jesus exceeded my expectation. I don't know what you came here for tonight. But I want you to know that God wants to exceed your expectation. I don't know what need you came here in your life. And God cares about that too. But I want you to know that God in his infinite power, he wants to do above and beyond even what you think you need. He wants to go above and beyond. Bow your heads, close your eyes, open your hearts. Brother, if you will, softly begin playing whatever the Holy Spirit lays on your heart to play. Lord, let the power of God flow in this service tonight. I, I need every believer that's filled with the Holy Spirit. Just begin to speak in your heavenly prayer language. Devil, you are a liar and you are not going to, you are not going to make this service just a, a mild service. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to do in every area of our life everything that needs to take place. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to exceed our expectation tonight. Go above and beyond, Lord. E even what we think we need, Lord, accomplish your work in Jesus' name. Let the power of God flow in this altar service tonight. The anointing that makes the preaching easy, let it flow. Let the fire of God consume every ounce of our being in this altar service. I speak victory in each person's life in this service. And I speak the anointing that destroys the yoke to flow in this altar service tonight. If you're here tonight, you'd say, Brother Todd, I'm in this building, but my life's not being lived for God. If you're here tonight and the Lord is dealing with you because you're not in right relationship with the Lord, I want you to know that Jesus loves you and he's ready to forgive you tonight. With nobody looking around, if you'd say, Brother Todd, I'm in this building and God's dealing with me tonight because I know my heart's not right with the Lord. If that's you tonight, I want you to lift your hand right now. If that's you, if you'd say, that's me and God's dealing with me and my heart's not really in right relationship with God, pray for me. Who else? Who else? God bless you. Who else? You say, that's me. Just lift your hand if that's you. Lift your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Quickly, anybody else? I don't want anybody looking around. If you raised your hand, stand up. Stand up if you raised your hand. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. Stand right now if that's you. Who else? Stand. Anybody else? Now quickly, step out from behind that chair into the aisle. Make your way to this altar and get on your knees at this altar. I need to 